What's going on everyone? It's Thomas DeLauer and I'm here with Dr. Stephen Cabral, who is the founder and owner of the Cabral Wellness Center in Boston. And he's all the way out here in California because today we're going to be talking about some pretty intriguing stuff when it comes down to the gut biome, when it comes down to dairy, when it comes down to overall how your body finds its own bioindividuality and balance. So Stephen, thank you for coming on here. And we've got some really cool stuff. So why don't you give a little bit of background on, on who you are and what you do so everyone knows who I've got here today. Sure, yeah, my pleasure, really happy to be here. So I'm a board certified naturopathic doctor. I specialize in Ayurvedic medicine, functional medicine, something called bioregulatory medicine. So what we do is we actually look at the individual and when we talk about um, whether it's keto based or whether it's carb based or whether it's kind of like more Mediterranean style diet, we look at hormones, we look at the gut microbiome and we also said, what's our end goal in mind? So we wanna know where does this person wanna go to? Are they doing a specific diet in order to transform their body, transform their hormones, transform their metabolism? And then once we know that end goal, we can actually customize a specific protocol for them. Gotcha, gotcha. Okay, so one of the things that Dr. Cabral has really blown my hair back with is his knowledge of the gut biome. And I've touched on the gut biome a little bit. I haven't gone into exquisite detail. I've talked a little bit about what's called the gut brain axis, you know, the communication between the gut and the brain. But a question that comes up a lot that I really want to dive into is, how the gut starts to adjust either on or off a ketogenic diet and not specifically ketosis because I know that's not necessarily your your wheelhouse to be speaking as a keto expert but you're definitely an expert when it comes down to metabolism and digestion and I've alluded to the fact before that our body responds differently to carbohydrates as far as our gut biome goes sure. and it responds differently with fats so when someone's coming off of a ketogenic diet some of their gut bacteria might be kind of skewed. And it's not good or bad, it's just kind of one of these situations that naturally occurs. So you were talking to me a little bit before we went on camera about how there's specific bacteria that feed on carbohydrates versus fats. Can you give kind of a general breakdown of that and then we can Correct. dive in? So one of the best things to look at if you're able to, and I know not everyone is able to, is actually to run something called an organic acids test. So organic acids test looks at the amount of yeast and actual fermentable based bacteria. Besides yeast, then there's also bacteria in the gut. Now, what we do is we look at how much yeast is there, and then we look at how much bacteria is there. So on an organic acids test and or a stool test, we can say, is there larger amounts of things called bifidobacterium that should be in the colon or amounts of acidophilus that should be more in the small intestine? We're also looking at um, the total amount of negative bacteria that should be there, Clostridium difficile, E. coli, Klebsiella, a lot of people believe when they hear they have E. coli bacteria in their gut, they're like, why do I have yep. that there? Well, it's supposed to be there just in a small amount. Yep. And it's that E. coli that actually helps to make B vitamins, vitamin K, so it's very, very important. Really? So the gut, the actual gut microbiome, 100 trillion bacteria, right? 100 trillion different cells in there, about 40 trillion of us. Well, the issue is this, when they're not in balance, then they can start to cause havoc. So our job is to first say, are they in balance? And if the answer is no, an actual going more towards a keto-based diet can actually help with that. Because our first goal is to eliminate a lot of the bacterial overgrowth in general. So we work with a lot of people with gut-based issues, whether it's candida overgrowth, SIBO, IBS, IBD, and our goal is to remove first. So a lot of people are always putting probiotics into their body, right? Well, the issue with probiotics is that if you already have bacterial overgrowth, probiotics are not the answer. They're gonna make things worse. Yeah. So what we do first is we will remove. So we'll remove the candida, the yeast overgrowth, the bacterial overgrowth, and we'll do that actually through modulating carbohydrates. So we'll take them way back for some people, and especially the ones, so we'll get into this now, that are more fermentable. Okay. So if you're eating things like healthy foods, right? If we're having the Brussels sprouts and the cauliflower, those are great foods, right? Onions and garlic, great foods, they're prebiotics. So they feed the gut bacteria, but they can also feed yeast and negative types of gut bacteria as well. So we remove those actually in the beginning, more towards a lower carb keto-based diet, and then we start to add those back in. So once we've eliminated the negative bacteria, what we start to do is very slowly add back in some of the fermentable carbohydrates. Again, I mentioned some of those, whether it's the cruciferous vegetables, uh, onions, garlic, and then also start with smaller amounts of starch. Okay. So root vegetable based starch, such as your yams, your sweet potatoes, your yuca, parsnips, things like that. And, it's, and right now what the research shows is about up to a half a cup. And the reason why this is important is adding only a half a cup back to the meal is that after that, the fructin levels start to get too high. And the fructins are what are the fermentable based sugars. Got it. Okay. So we have these things called FODMAPs. It's called fructo, oligo, mono, uh, now I'm talking in my head, mono and polysaccharide. So it's FODMAP. 
So what we're looking at is all the different sugars that are allowed to be fermented in the gut. So what we want to do is we want to ease those back in. Now, they're not bad for you because that's actually what the good uh, gut bacteria use to thrive and starts to grow. Yeah. So when you're on more of a keto-based diet, the bacteria actually, the microbiome starts to shrink. The amount of different, not the amount of different strains, but the actual amount of total bacteria. So we want to go easy as we add those back in. So if I'm, and correct me if I'm wrong, so basically if we have this ratio of, let's just make it simple and say good bacteria and bad bacteria, okay? Let's say we have, um, I'm just gonna say a random number, like I'm gonna say units just to make it simple. Let's say we have a 200 units of bad bacteria sure. and 100 units of good bacteria. So even if we were to add these higher FODMAP foods, these higher fermentable prebiotic foods, it would just continue to grow what is already skewed slightly more of. So if there's bad bacteria, then if you're adding these, even healthy vegetables and healthy foods and healthy sure. starches, it could potentially be growing more of that and putting you more out of whack. Exactly right. Okay. It's the reason why a lot of people do not thrive with fermented vegetables. Got it. So besides the histamine-based issues, fermented vegetables are usually cabbage, right? I mean, it comes with a base typically of cabbage. You can use beet, you can use carrot, but what happens is those are great prebiotics. Okay. So what they do is they allow, that's the base, I call it food for the bacteria or kind of like fish food for the bacteria. You put that in there, it. it allows the microbiome to grow. Well, in those people with a large amount of bacteria, the microbiome's already overgrown. Yeah. And what our job is to actually cut back on that. So what we do is we remove those foods in the beginning. We do it for about four to six weeks, then we start to ease them back in with actually onions and garlic being the last two. Yeah. Because we know onions and garlic are great for you, but at the same time, they're great prebiotics. Like same with the Jerusalem artichokes. Yep. So we yep. add those back a little later. Any bloating? If so, was it the total amount? Because that could be a two. We just might have had too much too soon. So one of the things too, I just want to mention is the last part, um, doing the gaps-based protocol. So we help kids with autism and we help people with IBS and, and SIBO and, and brain-based issues as well, is we go really small. Like we might add in a half a teaspoon, that's it. A half a teaspoon of fermented foods in the beginning. And the reason is that that's all they can tolerate. Yeah. So it's really, it's finding out what works best for your gut and going from there. That's why there is no one thing. That's the hard thing about bioindividuality and bioindividual medicine is what works right for you may not work great for your neighbor, your friend, or even your spouse. So circling it back to the, the topic at hand with ketosis, if you have someone, and I'm gonna circle this back to so many questions that have come through in the comment section before, is if someone is reintroducing carbohydrates to their diet for any reason, okay, I mean, they, they are on a keto diet, and maybe they have a big sporting event where they know they need to introduce some carbs for one reason or another, or maybe the ketogenic diet just isn't working for them after a couple of months, it happens, you know, and they have to start bringing carbs back in. Some people will come to me and they'll say, when I have carbs, I start getting super distended, super bloated. It never happened before until I was on ketosis and then started, uh, started reintroducing carbs. So what would you suggest for someone that's going through that, that has a shrunken uh, gut microbiome, but also has sort of this shrunken uh, carbohydrate fueled bacteria? Like what, what would they start with? Like what what's something tactical for them? Actually, that's a great question. So this comes back to, in my practice, all we look to do is test variables. So the variable in this question is, is it carbohydrates or is it a certain type of carbohydrate? Got it. So when you're looking at carbohydrates, just to go back to it, there's the fructo, oligo, di, mono, and polysaccharides. These are sugars that can ferment in the gut. It doesn't mean that they're bad. They actually, they're good in the long term because they feed that microbiome. Got it. Got it. But if it is that, if that's the issue, well, then we're going to not eat any of those carbs in the beginning, and we're just going to go with glucose, higher glucose-based carbs. Really? Okay. And so you'd say, okay, well, that's strange because that might spike blood sugar, but our goal right now is to figure out why you're bloated. Yeah. Our goal right now isn't to worry about blood sugar yet. It's to say, like, okay, let's look at a carb that isn't fermentable. Yeah. So if we're looking at a high glucose-based carbohydrate, it doesn't have time to ferment. It doesn't have time to, exactly yeah. right. So that's what yeah. I was just going to say is it does yeah. not have time to ferment. So if there's more glucose molecules, they can actually move through the, intest the stomach and intestinal wall before they ever make it to that bacteria or the yeast. Now, is that what we want in the long run? No, but if you don't get bloated from glucose, it's not a carbohydrate issue per se, it's okay. a specific type of carbohydrate. So it could be like an amylopectin kind of issue or something like that, like an actual type of starch that they're having a hard time with, or is it just, does it get down to, and I don't wanna go you know, too far on a tangent, but could it come down to literally different immune responses at that point? If it's not the carbohydrates, is it like, are you responding, having a certain IgG response to a certain strain in that carbohydrate, everything like that, is that kind of what you're alluding to? Like it could be a deeper problem? Um, it could be a deeper problem, but most likely still with the balance of the gut. Got it. So okay. when we're looking at food sensitivities, like this is actually, that was a really good point as well. 
the issue is this, like when we look at food sensitivities, if someone gets bloated, we actually don't call it a food sensitivity, we call it a digestive-based issue. So okay. for the most part, when we're looking at food sensitivities, which can come from carbs, not as much from fats, and that's why people typically feel great as they move towards a, a keto-based yep. diet, yep. And, but they come from protein. So obviously, proteins we know contain protein, but all these foods have a protein signature. And that protein signature is a strain of amino acids that can move through the gut wall. Now, when it moves through the gut wall, our immune system can attack that from an IgE response or an IgG response. There's other responses as well, IgA, IgM. But what we look for is, is there an immediate response? That would be IgE. That would be like brain fog, immediate headache, skin rash, uh, watery eyes, red ears, any of those things, IgE response. That's a histamine, that is a heat-based response as well. And then we have the IgG, that's like a day later, two days later, three days later at the most, 72 hours, where someone can actually have brain fog, skin rash, uh, joint pain, and so believe it or not, foods like, let's just say you're watching this on a Wednesday, you can actually have had a meal on Sunday night or Monday, that's affecting you on a Wednesday. So that's an IgG latent based response. Okay. That's why we test for those. So what we're looking at is if someone gets bloated right away, I'm not thinking protein immune based response, although it's possible. I'm thinking there is an issue with a lack of hydrochloric acid in the stomach. So what happens is that food is allowed to sit there for too long and starts to ferment and it starts to blow up this balloon in the stomach. Or if it's deeper down, it's right on the belly it. button, yeah. then we're looking at intestinal base and then it's something fermenting down there as well. Now, that can go back to improper microbiome. So if we're looking at the small intestine, a lot of people, they talk about acid and alkaline and they're not really talking about what compartment of the body we're, we're looking at. In your small intestine, it should be more acid-based. We're looking at acidophilus, right? We're looking at acidifying bacteria. So the bacteria in your, in your small intestine should be more acidifying. And that's the proper pH for your body to actually do the majority of the digesting and not allow those carbs to ferment. So hopefully that makes sense. No, more. that makes perfect sense because I mean, it's, there's a big difference between having bloating and having the bloating that occurs from an inflammatory response yes. in your body. Because correct, that's that's the confusion. People get is okay. I'm bloated. Is almost synonymous. I mean, people like don't really disassociate the fact that bloating in your digestive system versus bloating, like water retention. That's correct. inflammation, right? So there's the two different kinds right there that explains it. So the short answer is. The ketogenic diet is almost a way for you to temporarily, if that's the case, reset your gut biome to almost put you to a clean slate to be able to reintroduce starches. So just as someone that would go on like what's called an autoimmune paleo diet, where they're basically removing any potentially inflammatory foods in their diet and then reintroducing right. them, um, you're almost doing that with digestion, with the ketogenic diet. Um, so you might find after two months on a ketogenic diet that you just don't feel real good anymore. Sometimes it happens. I mean, I will be the first person as a ketogenic proponent to say that it happens to a lot of people. They go two, three months on a keto diet and they're just like, I felt great in the beginning, but now I just don't feel good anymore. And it's probably because your gut microbiome has shrunk so much that you're not able to have that diversity in your diet that you used to have. And that's a good time to really start introducing some other foods to make sure that you can kind of restore your gut bacteria a little bit. You combine, you combine exactly that with a little bit of herbal based, um, like oregano oil or caprylic acid that you might already be getting anyways on yep. a keto based diet. And you'll be able to really then take it down. And then if you want to use the probiotics, the fermented based yep. foods, that's the time to start implementing that. That's a good point. That's a really good point. So. I know there's a lot more that we can cover on this topic, but I know everyone on YouTube only has so much time. So thank you very, very much for coming on. My pleasure. We're gonna bring you a lot more content from Dr. Cabral talking about intermittent fasting, talking about dairy intolerance, and a number of other topics. So if you have ideas for future videos, make sure you put them in the comment section and make sure that you check out Dr. Stephen Cabral's podcast on iTunes. What's the name of it? The Cabral Concept. Awesome, and your new book? The Rain Barrel Effect. Okay, getting on Amazon, is it? Yep, right on Amazon right now, The Rain Barrel Effect. Okay. Perfect. Awesome. Talk to you guys soon.